I collect miniatures. Um, I, I have a whole bunch behind me now. I don't know if I, I can show you. Let's see, they're, they're in that. Oh, oh my. Cabinet. Hello, everyone, and welcome back for a brand new episode of Ladies Night. I have Lauren Lapkus with me today, and I am so excited to talk about everything you've done. And of course, we are paving the way right now to your new Netflix movie, The Wrong Missy. So how are you doing right now? I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm holding up okay. I mean, it's been such a roller coaster that everyone is on, but um, I think I'm in like a moment right now where I'm kind of adjusting and feeling like myself. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta get yourself in that kind of mind frame. And I feel like that's all yeah. you can ask for right now. So yeah. I'm glad you're doing all right. Uh, yeah. As we do every single ladies night, we got to start at the very beginning. And for you in particular, I want to know what is the moment that you realized you had a knack for comedy? Oh, wow. Um, I think it was when I was a kid and I, I, I really loved um, Saturday Night Live. I loved watching like I loved watching TV nonstop. I mean, sitcoms, cartoons, everything. I was always watching TV. Um, but I think that I realized I had a knack for it when I, I got into a children's theater play in my town that was just like anyone could audition, just local kids. And I didn't get, it was Beauty and the Beast. I didn't get any of the main parts at all. They actually just added in a side character named Mother Wolf and it was completely made up and never to exist again. And um, the character got to kind of like improvise in between little scenes. So I ended up getting laughs during that. And it really was just so validating. It was so fun. And that's the first memory I have of performing on stage and feeling the energy of that. So I know nothing about this Mother Wolf character, but I'm pretty sure that's how Disney could have brought their live action version of Beauty and the Beast to the next level if they cast you in that role. That is so true. They really missed out. I mean, it was a great role. I stood on the side of the stage mixing uh, an imaginary cake in a bowl. It was just like a mother, you know? <laughs> I'm curious, was she related to any of the characters we knew? Why did she pop up? No, I think it was like a runner through the play where I, I had like a husband and a, a child and we were finding someone who was missing or something. I really don't know. It was like unrelated to everything. <laughs> I do, I really just want kind of like these alt versions of all the Disney <laughs> classics rather than the straightforward reimaginations that we're getting right now. Yes, I know. This was all like probably local parents writing this and just being like, we have too many kids, we have to add some roles <laughs> to make it up <laughs> good on them for making it happen yeah. so it starts there for you and when you get to the point where you kind of realize you want to make a career for yourself in you know not just movies but comedy in general what is the end goal that you envision for yourself is it to be in comedy movies or is it stand-up or any other you know avenue in that field yeah, I think as a kid, it was so hard to imagine like getting on a TV show. I had no connection to Hollywood or anything like that. I didn't understand how someone went from just being a person to being inside the TV. Like it just didn't make sense to me. And so the only thing I really felt aware of was Saturday Night Live and the fact that, uh, you know, you could read books about this where like people would perform and then they would get to audition and they would be on the show and then they're on TV. So that made sense to me. And that was my goal for like my whole childhood into my adult life. Um, and once I got out to LA and started auditioning for commercials and all these different types of other things you could do, I realized that the path to this type of career could look like anything. And it wasn't just this one thing, but when you're a kid, it's so hard to know, like, how do you even figure this out? I mean, as an adult, it's hard to know how you figure it out. So. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I still don't know. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. one second and the next I'm down <laughs> a different path. But before you even moved to L.A., you moved to New York. So what was it like doing that? What what drove you to New York first? And what was the scariest part about picking up and actually moving to a big city like that? Yeah. Well, OK, so I grew up in Evanston, which is outside of Chicago. And I had spent a few years doing improv in Chicago and I, I was going to move to L.A. with my comedy partner at the time. And at the last minute, she was like, I want to move to New York. My family's in New York. I, I want to do that. And I just decided to go and do that instead. So it was really on a whim. And I figured I'd give myself like a year there and get to just live there and have that experience and then move to L.A., which is what I did. But it was I mean, it was kind of insane to just do that with no planning. I I truly was like. I think it was kind of the perfect age to do it because it was right after college, 
where you're still kind of naive about how the world <laughs> works for the most part. And I could just kind of go and not really think about how difficult it would be, which it was definitely difficult to live there. I applaud you all day long for that. It took me way too long to move from my hometown in New York to go out to LA. So I really oh, yeah. can imagine having that switch happen on you and just going with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I think it was just that feeling of like, well, I still want to perform with you. I don't know what to do. And like, I'll just go. So it, well, yeah, it was kind of a, a random choice. Plus, I always wanted to live there. So it, was, it wasn't like she just picked the middle of nowhere. You know, she picked New York City, which is a good city. Is this someone you still perform with? Or was there a kind of that situation where eventually you hit the point where you're like, you know, like, you're my partner, but now I need to branch out and feel confident doing this on my own? Yeah, it was that. I mean, we, we performed together in Chicago and in New York as well once we moved. Uh, but I also needed to make friends in this new city, so I couldn't just rely on her. And so I started doing, um, I did a children's theater company there called the Story Pirates, which is uh, this really great organization where kids write stories and then actors perform them on stage. So it's, it's and it's really like high quality. It's so great. It's so fun. Um, and I loved doing that and that the, the branching out in that way and meeting new people was so important for me because I think it would have been easy to just kind of stay close to what I knew and not try new things. There's no easy answer to this question, but whether it's New York or L.A. or no matter what scene of the industry you're in, I feel like it is very, very challenging to meet new people. So if someone out there wants to start building connections like that, what would you suggest that they do? Yeah, I mean, if you if you're interested in in acting, I would say to take a class of any type, like improv or just an acting class or a commercial auditioning class, anything that gets you to be in a room with other people, because that's so much of it. Like, I, I think I learned so much just from watching other people, and then you become friends just because you keep seeing each other every week. So it, it really was how I made all my friends in Chicago and New York was through improv and taking classes and, and kind of putting yourself out on a limb and, and suggesting like, hey, let's go get a drink or, you know, all that stuff is so hard, but you kind of have to push it sometimes. Whether it's just the social scene like that or even just with your on-screen comedy, have you always been someone who kind of never really worried about, you know, acting silly or going out on a limb? Or was that something that, that changed at some point in your life? Yeah, I think I think I thought of myself as someone who would do that. But then, you know, in certain situations, I would freeze up or whatever. And I, I do think like I started doing improv classes when I was in high school at Improv Olympic in Chicago. And that was so life changing because I think getting up on stage and, and really like feeling what it feels like to put yourself out there in that big way of performing in front of an audience rather than just like making remarks in a classroom or whatever, which is what I was doing before, uh, really like pushed me to, to figure out what my angle is and like to have confidence. And it, it's so hard. I, I definitely was nervous every week before class. Like I remember just taking the train there and, and and being so nervous, like, what am I going to say? And what am I going to do? And how's it going to go? And you, you can't plan it. So it was a good lesson. I give you all the credit in the world, because even when I do these things, it's just like every single question. I'm always fearful to like crack a joke because I know I'm not funny and it freaks me out to know. <laughs> no, it's everything is like that, though. I feel like that it never goes away fully for I mean, I can't imagine it goes away for anyone. There's always that feeling of a little bit of nerves of everything, you know, all these all these things we do where we put ourselves out there. What was it like getting your first big gig? Actually, before I even go that far, what what is the gig for you that kind of made you believe that, you know, this isn't just what I want to do. This is what I'm doing. I am pursuing a career down this route now. Yeah, I mean, I thought it about every all, all the first jobs I got, I was really excited. I, I got a couple commercials and I got um, a, 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 one time I got to do a sketch on Jimmy Kimmel with Ryan Reynolds. And that was huge for me. That was my first like TV appearance. Um, but then I, I booked a pilot at, that got picked up and it was called Are You There Chelsea? And it was Chelsea Handler's sitcom for NBC starring Laura Prebon, who I later reconnected with on Orange is the New Black. And that was really huge for me because I had never auditioned for a pilot that I got a series regular role and I and then the show got picked up. So we got to like actually be on TV. And that was insane. And it kind of was a, a marker for my family and like people I knew that like, oh, this is actually working out like yeah, I got a big part. Did anyone in your life, whether it was family or friends, uh, that kind of really needed that convincing? Was there any was there any doubt coming your way that you had to say, like, I have this thing now and I can prove it to you? 
It's weird because I actually think my parents have always been so supportive. And even if they, I think in the moments when they were like doubtful, it was more out of like not understanding how things work or just knowing the odds are against you as an actor. But it was never that they didn't believe in me, but just that thing of like, is this really possible? Like, I don't know anyone else who's done this. So it, that was the kind of feeling I had that like, as much as anyone supported me, I still had to prove like, oh, you can, it, it can actually happen. Like, that, it's not just like that you think I'm good. It's that like I did all these things and got through all these hoops and, and it really happened. So I think there's with actors, like there's probably still always that feeling of trying to prove something to somebody, even if you can't name who that person is. It's like that little voice inside yourself more than anything. Is there anything about Are You There, Chelsea, that makes you think, I am so thankful that I had that early opportunity on that particular show on that set with those people and, you know, maybe not elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing because, first of all, the the writers of the show were so funny and so supportive and they really like everyone understood that it was my first big job. So I look back at it and I think like, oh, I definitely did things that I wouldn't do now or, you know, probably said dumb stuff that I, I now know how things work better or whatever. But that's all that all just comes with the territory when you're getting your first jobs, because no one tells you how anything works in this business. You just have to like do it and then kind of pretend you understand. And then eventually you do. And everyone was great. And it was like such a cool show to be on. I, I had so much fun. It was so short lived. We only got to do 13 episodes. So, you know, for me, it was huge. And I, I don't know where it stands in everyone else's um, history. But for me, because it was my first job, I was like, I I'm on a sitcom. You know, it doesn't matter if it doesn't go on forever. I get to, like, learn how to be on the set and learn all the rules and all the ways things work, where the camera goes, where I'm supposed to stand. It was just like a great education in that way. What is something on that set that made you go, oh my, like I thought it worked this way, but it actually happens this way. And this makes a lot of sense now. Oh yeah, well this one, this is a really dumb thing, but I remember like before my first taping, I was standing backstage and I realized I had like really sweaty pits because <laughs> I was nervous and I was like, Oh, I said to like the costumer, like, oh, um, I my armpits. And she was like, oh my god! And she started like blow drying my armpits because, of course, you don't see anyone on a sitcom with sweaty armpits. But I, I just was like, oh, I won't lift my arms. Just you know, I'll just. And she started like blow drying them, and then uh, from that point on, they put these things in my my dress, my shirts sure, called dress shields, which are like little like armpit pads, which are amazing by the way. If anyone sweats <laughs> and you're going to like an event, it's like the best thing ever. But that was so huge. I was like, oh, they can fix anything. They, they want me to look perfect. They want this to look right. I, I, I shouldn't just pretend everything's fine and go along with it. Um, so that was a great lesson because I think it, it taught me to like speak up if I, if I have an issue, you know, and not just be embarrassed and pretend everything's fine. As much um, as I appreciate the attention to detail, sometimes things like sweaty pits or seeing someone wake up in a scene with messy hair just makes me even happier because it feels so real and true to my existence. Oh my God, no, I completely agree. I think it's just uh, on the multicam world where everything is so perfect, you know, it's like, you can't get away with that. Jennifer Aniston never walked out of Friends with some sweaty arm. That is a very, very <laughs> fair point. Speaking of multicam or any style of shooting for that matter, is there any particular shooting format that you still find the most difficult to adjust to? It was great that I started on multicam, I think, because it's a really precise format. And so you have to hit your mark exactly right and say your line exactly as you've rehearsed it so that every camera that's moving knows exactly what to do. It's more like a play that's being shot perfectly in time. So it was a great way to start because I, I started with coming from a perspective of I have to do everything just so. And then when I was able to get roles on single cam shows, like something like Orange is the New Black, you know, you still have to hit your mark and people are expecting you to do things a certain way, but there's a little more of a looseness to it. And I was able to like kind of fall into that. I think it's hard to go the other way in my guess, you know, my estimation, like if you start with the more looser format and then have to go into the more particular format, it's a little trickier. But for me, it was a great way to start. And you're, it seems like you're very into kind of experimental forms of comedy, whether it's different platforms, different ways to capture it. So is there anything on the horizon for you in that respect, something new that you're really excited to kind of, you know, dig into and give it a shot? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I'm always trying to figure out the next thing. And I do a lot of podcasts. And something I've started doing is um, watch alongs where I talk over a show and people can sync it up with the show or the movie. 
And that's been really fun in quarantine because I am, uh, you know, just here with my husband and we're kind of bored sometimes. So actually, I don't want to say I'm bored. I'm not bored, but I uh, I want to be creative. And so this is a way to do that. And uh, people have been saying it makes them feel like they're not alone. So it's been kind of a creative, you know, way to create something that can make people feel a little better during their day. This is um, crossing my yeah. mind now. But do you know the only watch along I've done since quarantine began? It's mm. Blue Brothers. Really? Oh, that's awesome. I, I sat on my computer for, I guess it was four hours with like a big box of beer and with a, with a buddy of mine, we just watched the entire thing. Wow. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> it, was, it was very amusing. How did he not rope you into that show? I, I, I think I was doing something else at the time because the, I, I know it was a discussion because I, I love those guys who made that show and I want to be on it. I'm hoping if they get a second season that I can come on. I feel like the more comedy we get that's about beer and breweries the better oh my god yeah it's a whole it's not i mean i was gonna say it's an untapped market and that was like a horrible pun and i wanted to stop myself so i i still said it i don't know i am all for a horrible pun (laughs) i do want to go back to orange is the new black though because that show was a very big deal for me and it did kind of feel like the thing that launched original content or at least one of the uh, shows that launched original content on netflix in a new way so what was it like first signing on to that and at what point during the process did you realize like, wow, this is going to change the game for consuming content in the future? Yeah, I mean, my so signing on to the process was really I got an audition in my email and I, I did a self tape from home because the, the casting director, Jen Houston, works out of New York. So I did an audition in my apartment, like just shot it and then sent it off and kind of had no idea what it would what the show would be, because there were no other streaming shows. And I mean, House of Cards hadn't even come out yet. So it was like this whole this whole uncharted territory where I just didn't even know what it was. I was like, I guess Netflix is not going to do DVDs anymore. Like, You just can't even wrap your head around it. So at the time, I don't think I realized for a long time that it was going to be so huge. Um, but then once things started streaming and, you know, and we we're waiting for the show to come out, I remember the anticipation of the show coming out and and how cool it was. And it, it was just so it was so huge. It was crazy to be a part of that. I, I loved following along, but looking back, and I'm sure there's a lot of answers to this question, but if you had the opportunity playing that character to have more scenes with anyone else in that ensemble, who would you choose and why? Oh, uh, Natasha Leon. She's my favorite. I just think she's the funniest. And we had a fun moment. I think it was in season two where it seemed like she was going to try to hook up with me as like part of her, you know, dare system or whatever it was. Um, and that was just hilarious to me. So I feel like she would be the most fun to work with. There's a whole lot of her filmography to be obsessed with, but obviously at the top of my mind right now is Russian Doll, which is- I haven't watched it yet. I'm like, this is- a- Binge it. No, that's great. I actually always forget all these shows that I want to binge and I'm like, I need to like write it down because I want to watch that. There is just so much out there right now. Like yeah. I'm I'm shocked I keep up with as much as I do, but do you know what I did just binge? Not yeah. Bruce Brothers now, but- I not that I had to do this, but I re-binged the entire Jurassic franchise because Fun. that's my thing. Jurassic Park is my favorite movie of all time. So you're not getting out of this conversation <laughs> with Jurassic with me for a little bit. But I know that you and Jake did a lot of improv on Jurassic World. So was there any particular line or beat that we can see in the movie that you are especially proud of that you guys came up with? Yeah, I mean, I think all of the conversations that we're having at the top of the scenes are improvised kind of uh, dialogue before, you know, the, you can tell when the script comes in when we're talking about dinosaurs. Um, but then <laughs> at the end, when when I say I have a boyfriend, that w- we shot it two different ways. And um, we so Colin Trevorrow, the director, allowed us to improvise within that scene. So the, the idea was just that I was turning him down. I have a boyfriend and we kind of went from there with what everything else that was said in that scene. So I think that was all improvised after that point. And then we shot it a different way where it was sort of the triumphant, like on the underdogs get the kiss and the you know moment in the superhero movie that they normally don't get. Um, and it just ended up being way funnier for it to not work out. So I, I love that choice. Mighty amused by that. Is there anything you guys came up with that you are bummed that didn't make the final cut? We kind of just were casual about the improv at the top of the scene. That's where we were allowed to be a little free with it. And I remember that we we would improvise for a long stretch of time. And it was really cool that Colin was willing to let us do that. So I was just excited to see what ended up being in the movie. And I, I couldn't really remember what we had said, but... 
uh, it was cool that a bunch of, you know, that loose stuff was in there. Is there any particular uh, dino jargon that tripped you up? Oh, God, all of it. I mean, it's so hard and I didn't want to say anything wrong. Um, yeah, I, I, I know that I'm like, I talk about like the packies have escaped the this or that, you know, <laughs> it's like, I don't remember all of the terms, but, uh, the hardest part I think for me was like, just, we were looking at blank screens while having these emotional reactions. So that was the most challenging part. I have to ask you this now, because I know Jake is returning for Dominion. What, what's up? You I don't know. No, I mean, I'm not in it. So I know that I'm, I'm a, uh, I have not received a phone call, but it's okay. <laughs> I, well, My character is still alive. So I'm, I'm like, you know, there's always <laughs> the next one. There, well, there's that. And I'm also a big believer. Have you seen the short film battle at big rock? No, I haven't seen that. I, Highly recommend checking that out. Colin directed it, and it's just uh-huh. supposed to take place in between uh, the events of Fallen Kingdom and Dominion. But that makes me believe that there are so many mini stories to tell in between right. on the That's big cool. screen. So, like, I want to know where Vivian's working post Jurassic World Fall. So do I. I mean, I, I hope it's something equally exciting and not just like a library. I don't know. <laughs> Because I could talk about this stuff all day. Like, if you had to creatively come up with her post Jurassic World experience, like, what do you think she goes and does after having this traumatic experience? Does she snap back? No, you know, I think I'd like to think that she snaps back, but she probably went to like extensive therapy to like recover, like, kind of took some time at home, you know, just relaxing, getting over everything. And then maybe trying, maybe she applied for a job at the new park and didn't get accepted. I don't know. Maybe that's why she's not in it. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah i mean I, I pretty much would understand that kind of reaction and then not being able to move forward with what that whole operation winds up being totally. because you know it's not smart to put dinosaurs in a mansion and auction them all for four million dollars <laughs> <laughs> um the wrong missy now and actually specifically working with the happy madison team how did that come about for you because i know you were in blended so did you kind of get to connect the dots on that Yeah, that was really just a random connection. I didn't know if they would even remember me from that movie, truly, because I I had such a small part in Blended. And it was huge for me at the time because I, like, always loved Adam Sandler and, like, was so excited to get to work on that movie. And then, you know, years later, this audition came in and I really went in because David Spade was attached to star in it. And I was like, oh, I I love David Spade. I, I would like to be in a movie with David Spade. So that was really the thing that got me to go to the audition. And then the character itself is so fun. Like, it's just... It's so wild, but um, really, I think it was just going to the audition was uh, almost fresh eyes on me as far as they were concerned. Because it was so long between this movie and Blended, and my part was so small before. And so, yeah. What did they have you do in that audition? Because her moments are just so big that I I can't condense them to like a little audition space. Yeah, I know. It's kind of crazy looking back and thinking about how probably tame my audition was compared to what ended up being in the movie. But- <laughs> Missy, what are you doing here? That text from you was wonderful. I screwed up so huge. Remember that crazy blind date I had? Nothing you could ever do would disappoint me. I love you. This whole time I thought I was texting my dream girl. <laughs> I was texting that crazy girl. I love doing big comedy like that so much. But you still want to find the heart and you still want to feel like these people are real on some level, at least within the world that we've created. So I think the script had some, had some good moments that kind of gave us that feeling of like, okay, there's a real connection here, or here's the backstory that is explains a little bit of why Missy is like this. And <laughs> those things were really important to like, remember as we were doing it. Cause as wild as it gets, you still want to feel like, okay, this person actually could walk through the world and be a real person. There is some real sincerity towards the end of it though, that, that, that I believed in and I appreciated those beats. Um, were, so you said you were a big Adam Sandler fan. Early Adam Sandler days, beginning of Happy Madison, what is the favorite? Billy really Madison, probably. I also just love SNL so much growing up. So when the years that um, David and Adam and Chris Farley were all on, those were like my favorite seasons of all time, you know? So it's kind of, Th- that was so much of it too. I would just think about Gap Girls, all those scenes I could probably quote in, in their entirety and getting to meet these guys has been so cool. So after all that, what is it like day one stepping onto set with David Spade when not only are you doing like these huge comedic beats with him, but there's also a romance there? 
It's crazy. I mean, I think like when we, and the nice thing was that the director, Tyler Spindle, had us have a bit of a rehearsal beforehand where we just read the script out loud at a table together. And that was really nice because it kind of broke the ice a little bit. Cause it's this character is so wild that to just meet someone and then within two seconds be like screaming at them is like a lot. So I was glad that I had a second to get to know him a little bit as a person um, before I started like uh, insulting him and on screen. Who is your go to on set when you want to know that you're not going too big with a moment like that? Can you feel it? Is it your director? Or are you looking at the person starring opposite you? What's what's the go to in that respect? I think with this movie, it was a combination of all three. It's like it's David and Tyler and me because we we wanted to push it so much and it, it was really fun to get to see how far I could take this character. So we improvised a lot and I got to say a lot of crazy things, a lot of which made it into the movie, which I'm shocked by. But <laughs> it was great because I think we, you know, we we take it really far and then Tyler might go, okay, that was a little too far. The things that aren't in this movie are probably insane um, because the movie itself is wild. What's What's an example of a moment where you guys went too far and had to reel it back in? Well, it's crazy because I have, okay, so I haven't gotten to see the movie in a few months. So I need to like rewatch it and realize, like go over what was improvised and what was not or whatever. But um, I know that I screamed things that were beyond inappropriate. I mean, I just, I know I did. So I can't really probably say them on here. (laughs) Uh, You can say anything you want on (laughs) Uh, I am not surprised that that's what it came to with that character. What about some of the physical comedy in this movie? Was there any particular scene where just figuring out all of that was especially tough to pull off? Yeah, there were a bunch. I mean, I think when I read the script initially, I I read all these huge physical things that the character was going to do. But on some level, I was just thinking like, well, that will be a stunt double. Like that won't be me doing that part. And I'll be chilling in a a chair nearby while somebody does that. Um, But that wasn't the case. So for most of those stunts, they would have me do like 75% of the stunt just so that you could see me and my face and all that stuff to sell it more. And then uh, right at the part where it would get heroin for me, a, a stunt double would swoop in. So I had three like amazing stunt doubles throughout the film because there were so many different types of stunts and stunt doubles are often, you know, experts in certain things. Some people are better at tumbling or jumping or swimming or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I had three different women who were all skilled in different ways to like pull this off. And it was crazy. I mean, these, I mean, I, I was physically exhausted from what I did and I know it was nothing compared to what they did. These women were like, you know, taking the hit for me. So it was really impressive to watch. What's the uh, what's the reboot routine for you after a really tough, challenging day that leaves you exhausted? How do you snap back for the next one? Really? Well, it was interesting for me during this time because it was my first big leading role. Like I never really have to go to set every single day when I'm in a movie because most of the time I have a smaller part. And so I didn't have much time to bounce back <clears throat> between each day. So really, it was just a matter of like, <clears throat> excuse me, going home as soon as I could back to the hotel and like settling in, not talking to anyone, just trying to memorize the lines for the next day and um, hope that I just got enough sleep so that I had the energy that I needed to like get into my screaming match the next day with this character. Do you have an onset vice that you turn to, like a, like a Diet Coke or a coffee or anything like that? That's the thing. I don't drink caffeine and I don't, so I don't really have anything like that. Um, I just I try to eat healthy so that I don't fall asleep. Um, so that really would be the only thing is just not letting myself like go eat 10 donuts because I, they have everything available to you that you could want. And it's very hard to not pick those things. But I've learned that I definitely start to crash if I have a donut for breakfast. So I should probably not have a donut. Makes sense. I was very <laughs> bored for you when you said you don't have caffeine and you do all this crazy work nonstop. But <laughs> eating healthy is probably the smarter approach that I should take to heart. (laughs) It took me a long time to get to that point. I don't even, and I wouldn't say I'm like perfect by any means, but it's just that feeling of like choosing between the two options in the moment of like, a banana is probably going to be better than uh, this donut. So yeah, that's, that's probably a fair choice. Um, Is there anything over the course of your career that you've done for a comedy and looking back, you're like, well, that was funny then, but I'm never doing that again. It was too much. Mm, well, what do you mean? Like something that went to across the line? I was trying not to narrow it down too much because the possibilities yeah. didn't seem endless. I don't know. I guess you could take it in a serious route, whether looking back, it was crossing the line or maybe it was just like a really big stunt that I don't know, makes you feel oh, silly. Yeah. Well, I guess I did learn a bit like 
uh, over the years I have tried to do stunts that I'm not trained for. Like I, I remember shooting some web series that actually never saw the light of day where I had to, this was like when I first moved to LA and I had to like shoot a gun and like, they wanted me to like fly basically horizontally onto a mat and shoot the gun, which is really, really hard to do. And it's hard to jump at all onto a mat without like clenching your body if you're not trained in this. Um, but I think I, over the years, like I always would just try to do everything. And that's something that I think I learned, especially on this movie. Like I can say, oh, that's, that's a step too far for me. I can't do that. I know physically I can't do that. And it's not, it's not a, a complaint or a slight against anyone. It's like just knowing your boundaries, I think is something I've, I've learned a bit more over the years. Oh, a stunt like that does sound like something that would probably require wire work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even, I'm sure some strong woman could do that, but I, it's not me. <laughs> um, and over the course of the years, is there anyone you've worked with that, I don't know, has ever made you feel nervous that you won't be able to keep up with them? Because you've worked with such powerhouses over the years. I imagine there is an intimidation factor that comes with it, no matter how many years you've been doing this. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, there are people where... It's just their presence is intimidating just because you, you admire them and it's like nothing they're putting out. You know what I mean? It's just that feeling of like, oh, I've watched this person for years. And I felt that with so many people. Um, I mean, gosh, I, I could name so many. I mean, I think Will Ferrell is a good example, like just doing scenes with him and, and feeling like, oh, I, I hope this is he thinks this is going well you know it, it's so you can never tell and everyone's so you know he's so nice and I, would, I was gonna say everyone's so nice not everyone is so nice he's exceptionally nice but um it's it, it's that feeling of just like not letting your doubt take over too much and and just keep trusting yourself i, I think like working with zach alfanakis i think he's one of the funniest mm -hmm. people ever and he would make me laugh so much and he's amazing at physical comedy and and so fearless and mostly I just was like, I just don't want to laugh and ruin what he's doing. So that was something I've had to work on. <laughs> of, of all those projects that you've done on different platforms and in different formats, is there any one in particular recently that's kind of challenged you in a new way that you weren't expecting? Oh, wow. I mean, I think I think with just doing um, this movie really did challenge me in a lot of ways because I had to commit super, super hard to this character. And I think um, that was a great lesson you know, because sometimes you can do kind of winky uh, improv where you're kind of like, you know, nodding to the audience, like I'm in on the joke as well. And with this character, I just had to go completely to the wall with it and not take it, um, not have any sort of wink to the character because it's just so outrageous that you have to commit 100 percent or it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was a, something that I think was really important for me to do to kind of see like, oh, it, it takes like this level to, to pull this off. She's so true to herself from start to finish. It's like she knows who she is and she freaking owns it nonstop. Yeah. So it's an admirable trait for sure. She has no uh, worries about what anyone is thinking about her, which that's not true for me. Oh, <laughs> no. Well, I mean, we all have that. And I feel, like, I feel like if we all didn't have that, it it would be a situation where we all didn't want to keep getting better and better as people or oh. what we do. So... I don't know. Yeah, I think Missy's an exception to that, where she's still trying to learn new things while also not caring what people think, and she'll she also will scream at anyone. So there's yeah. a you know, there's a weird part to that. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta find the the fine line somewhere. In yeah. that. Um, is there anything that you still really want to learn about the industry and how it works? Do you have any interest in getting behind the lens more often? Yeah, I think directing is something I'm really interested in. I, I directed a short film uh, last year and that was really fun for me. And just, it's just a great experiment to like see how it works. And um, that's something I'm really interested in doing more of it. it it's a whole different skill set, So it can be a little intimidating to try to get into that. But um, I've seen a lot of my friends, you know, take that step and it's something I'm really interested in. Is there anyone in particular that kind of serves as a motivating factor in that respect where you watch what they did? You were so proud and you're like, I want to follow you in that path. 
Oh, well, my friend Maureen Barucha is so amazing. She's a, and my, also my friend Sarah Moshman. These are two uh, female directors I'm very close with who are like incredibly talented and everyone should go watch their stuff. I will actually uh, make a plug for Sarah Moshman. She has a new documentary called Nevertheless, it's all about sexual harassment in the workplace. It's like amazing. It, um, and Maureen has a new movie called Golden Arm that just was at South by Southwest. And um, I think they'll be releasing it virtually. And Sarah's, so all of Sarah's documentaries um, are, are, female empowerment base. She did one called Losing Sight of Shore about four women who rode the Pacific Ocean, which is a feat that had never been achieved by four women. So that documentary just left Netflix. I don't know where it's going to be next, but you can stream it somewhere else. But she just is always doing empowering stuff. And and I really, really admire her. We've been oh, friends since we were 12. So it's really cool to see. I love that so much. And it does seem like you, like, especially if you're, if you're part of the, uh, the happy Madison family right now, I don't know, it just seems like you keep working with the same people and you've got a really good community around you. And I don't know what better place to be in to keep getting creative and do, do, do different yeah. things. Yeah. I do think it's nice to have that loyalty. I really admire that about the whole happy Madison team that they, they keep people around and it, it's really nice. Nice. Here's another Happy Madison question for you. Is there anything about their process with making a feature that makes them stand out from other production companies you've worked with? Well, I think one thing that's what's been interesting for me is that because it was my first big role in this way, I, I was able to be aware of more conversations like that than I typically am. I, I think I usually just am, you know, arriving on set to my my scenes and that's really all I get to see. So I, I got to know the producers and they were so cool and really wanted me to feel comfortable and wanted me to be able to express myself fully. And they were so creatively supportive. So I'm really, really grateful that they were so open and excited to work with a, a new person. You know, they, they weren't clicky about their whole crew. I love hearing that. A uh, firm believer that a film crew is a family. So if you don't have those positive vibes, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it's so true. So we always end ladies night with some rapid fire questions. Okay. Many of which I've asked before. A lot of them just come to my mind on the spot. So okay. let's go with what is the most recent TV show that you've binge watched? Oh, um, well, binge is such, oh gosh. I, well, I mean, it's Real Housewives. I'm always watching Real Housewives. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not really a reality TV show person, but I will say this is a good plug for Netflix. The Netflix reality dating shows have just like seeped their way into my life and they're not. They are there. Yeah. <laughs> have you watched either Too Hot to Handle or Love is Blind? I watched them both. Yes, I watched them both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep going down this path now. Who is your favorite uh contestant and or couple on each? Oh my gosh. Okay, well, I can't really remember anyone's name on Too Hot to Handle. I kind of was doing a puzzle while I watched that one, which I think is totally appropriate. I to. Uh, <laughs> but that show actually, I think, upset me more than it made me feel good about anything. I think Love is Blind uh, was a little more hopeful. I, I loved Lauren and um, Cameron. I thought oh, they yeah. were sweet and seemed to really be in love. So that was my favorite on that show. I, I'm definitely... Um, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm team Lauren and Cameron. I, like, I love these shows so, so much. I know, me too. Do you collect anything? I do. I collect miniatures. Um, I, I have a whole bunch behind me now. I don't know if I, I can show you. Let's see. They're, they're in that. Oh, oh my. <laughs> How did you get into that? Um, well, I've really been doing it my, I, my whole life. I kind of realized recently, like, oh, I think I could put all these different collections I've had forever into one thing, and it would look like I've been doing something on purpose. And so I kind of found all these boxes of old uh, little miniature guys that I'd collected as a kid. And I also have been collecting these these little naked boy dolls that have different heads. Uh, they come in a blind box. They're called Sunny Angel Dolls. And you, they, you, they pop up in the weirdest stores. You would never expect. I, I couldn't tell you where to find them, but I come across them all the time. And I only buy them if I see them in person. So it's like a, a sort of, you know, there's a control. Okay, that's that's what we all need. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one of the few things that I do collect, which is a problem because they're usually nice and pricey, are film props, which does make me want to ask you one more Jurassic question. And I mm -hmm. swear, but at that, did you keep anything from set? Um, I, I didn't keep anything except I think I still have, we had to get NASA clearance to shoot the movie because oh, yeah. all the scenes in the control room were on NASA's like, um, I don't know, grounds, whatever. They had also put, had a, a movie lot sort of created within this NASA area. We had to get NASA clearance. So I have a card that they gave me, uh, with that, but yeah. 
Okay. That's a, that's a cool thing to be able to keep. (laughs) Um, Let's go with a serious one. What is your biggest fear that you've overcome? Who? One of them is trying new foods. I really spent a lot of my childhood being a and, and adult life being a picky eater. And I, I've gotten to a point now where I don't stop myself as much from trying new things. I try to be more open-minded and just at least give something a taste. What is the most adventurous thing you've eaten recently? Well, it's not okay. It's not that I get adventurous all the time. It's that I've allowed myself to eat things that everyone else thinks are normal that I was weird about. So I feel like the last like five years, I started eating sushi, and I never would have eaten that before. And now I love it, and I'll try anything with sushi. sushi is great. That's that's a crazy one for me. I still kind of eat like a ten year old. It's like if my diet could just be ice cream, peanut butter sandwiches, and cereal, I would. Well, I, no, I'd be happy to eat all that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a very happy person. Um, Finally, let's go with what is on your bucket list career wise. Is there any specific genre you want to tackle, a filmmaker you're dying to work with, anything at all? Oh, wow. I think my dream would be to do another big comedy like this. I I really admire Melissa McCarthy and uh, Maya Rudolph and women like that and and Amy Poehler, like people who had amazing careers doing really fun, big movies. And I would love to get to do the characters that are as big as Missy and something else. It's, it's so fun. I believe you're going to get that opportunity wholeheartedly. And when you do, you come back on ladies night and we'll talk about it all over again. Thanks so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time today. And to everybody out there, when this is running, actually the wrong Missy is going to be available on Netflix. So go check it out now. Again, thank you for your time. I hope you are staying safe and we'll see you next time.